the murders wouldn't have happened without his involvement in Scientology because he had come to believe certain things as a consequence of Scientology, which led to the events of July and August 1969. Because of Scientology, he came to believe he was a reincarnation of Jesus. John, you're the ex-Scientologist who joined a cult, and in many ways, you're a celebrity who joined a cult. Today, we'll be talking about the celebrities that maybe you didn't know joined or were in cults. The obvious ones, of course, are the Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Alison Mack from Smallville, and we'll discuss them a little, I'm sure. But let, what, what's, what, who would you like to talk about? Who's a, who's a celebrity who's joined a cult that people might not know about or, or was in a cult? Oh, and people may or may not know about it. I I was surprised in researching this to, to find out that there's so many people who've been in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so Michael Jackson, mm. Janet Jackson, they grew up in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So did Venus and Serena Williams. Um, and they are still members. And Serena Williams is bringing her kids up in this group. And, it, you know, they're a big group. There are seven or eight million Jehovah's Witnesses. They've, they've seen a lot of defections in the last five or six years. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty harsh regime. I, I would say it's, you know, if we're putting it on a scale, it's probably not as bad as Scientology, <laughs> uh, I, I would generally say. But they're, they beat their kids. Um, they're known to do it at the back of the Kingdom Hall. If a kid starts making a noise, they'll get a beating in a little room where the congregation, while worshipping God, can hear the, the screams of their children to... Um, do something wow. or other to them. So it's pretty hard. Um, President Eisenhower grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. George Benson, the guitarist, uh, has been a Jehovah's Witness all his life. Prince. Prince actually joined after his mum died. And you've got this kind of gay icon drug user who's going out, handing out leaflets and knocking on doors. I'd love to have seen that. I'd love to have had Prince come to my door and Ask you know, sell me a, a copy of, or give me a copy of, uh, of witness literature. How wonderful! Uh, Naomi Campbell, Jerry Halliwell of the Spice Girls, um, Patty Smith grew up in the Jehovah's Witnesses. She didn't stay, um, and, and Naomi Campbell left as well. Biggie Smalls, notorious B.I.G. Uh, Biggie, one of the most famous rappers of all mm. time. Um, Larry Graham, who was with Sly and the Family Stone and is one of the most innovative bass players of, of the generation. Um, he worked with Prince as well. He has remained a witness. Hank Marvin of The Shadows, uh, who you've never heard of, um, joined the right. Jehovah's Witnesses as an adult, having become successful with, with The Shadows. So that, that's quite a roster of, of stars. To remain on this a little bit, Michael Jackson, I gather, also participated in the door-to-door -door evangelizing. He attended meetings at the Kingdom Hall. Uh, he followed the religion's moral and ethical guidelines. Um, and then it gets a bit awkward because you're not... I mean, th th this is an awkward thing in itself, I think, because you're talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. And like a lot of sort of cults and extreme religions, they they preach against any kind of individualism often because that doesn't work that well in cults and things, apart from Scientology, which we'll get onto, I'm sure, later on. Um, and yet Michael Jackson wanted to be this big, famous celebrity and a lot of his lifestyle cho choices went against it. So what what do you think it is about Jehovah's Witnesses that has spawned so many celebrities who are going against the teachings of its own religion? Well, firstly, it is a large group. If if you're dealing with Scientology, you've got a group of, there are now about 25,000 paid up members of the International Association of Scientologists. So when you've got seven or eight million, um, you've got quite a spread. Um, it, it is a harsh regime. We know that, that the Jackson Five, the Jackson children, had a really hard time of it. And I think sometimes the kind of militaristic attitude of these groups actually pays off later in life in the sense that a person can become driven and, you know, achieve a great deal because they've been driven. However, in terms of how happy or satisfying their lives will be, I think Michael Jackson is a a terrible example. He he became the king of pop with the help of Quincy Jones, of course, the great Quincy Jones. But he never he never really seemed to have a, a life. He he seemed to be um shallow 
and distressed much of the time. Um, and you got the cover-up marriage to Lisa Marie Presley at the time was a Scientologist. Um, she she left um, because she said she was slowly beginning to self-destruct in Scientology. Her mum, Priscilla Presley, left as well. But you had this arranged marriage, and it, it's one of the few times that, that I have been a celebrity. I was asked by People magazine what would happen to the, the Jackson-Presley marriage, and I said, it will fail. So, um, and that, you know, I've been in the National Enquirer as well, you know, I mean, it's not just people. <laughs> um but so I, yeah, I think there there is that sense that if you've had a really hard childhood, that that it can make you tougher. But you will have a lot more difficulty being happy. You know that there'll be an awful lot of pretense going on. Um, so, and it, as I say, you know, the witnesses are a kind of extreme form of Christianity. A, for me, nonsensical form, having studied their teachings. Um, they they basically use a Bible that's been translated by people who don't speak Greek or Hebrew properly. <laughs> so their Bible is a little bit wacky, all in all. And they're ruled by a little group of elders who, of course, don't follow the rules that the members have to follow, which is the fairly usual sort of thing. Um, and indeed, one of, one of their uh, ruling cabin, uh, cabinet defected and wrote a book about them, which is, you know, a wrong and bad thing to do. We should not criticise. We should, you know, free speech. We shouldn't have that. Sure, sure. Is that one of the things that makes it a cult rather than a religion, that there are different hierarchies and statuses given to uh, people at the top? They don't have to play by the same rules? I, to some extent, but it, but it, it's a difficult question, isn't it? That um, I talked with a guy who was a, brought up in the traditionalist form of catholicism the other week and um you know you have to say well let's you know in, in talking to him i said let's forget the word cult let's talk about authoritarianism let's talk about you have to do what you're told you're not allowed to think for yourself you're not allowed to ask questions you're not allowed to challenge the dogma in any way and in that sense a lot of mainstream religions would actually be cults that that you're you're supposed yeah. to do it this way. You can't challenge it. Um, and and they enforce all sorts of petty rules on how you live. Of course, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses are well known. They don't celebrate birthdays and they don't celebrate Christmas, which is pretty miserable, isn't it, really? Um, yeah. I, I gave a talk years ago to a... They, they call themselves apostates because that's what they're called by... The Jehovah's Witness says, I, I personally wouldn't adopt the negative term given to me by uh, somebody who hated me. But there you go. Um, but they call themselves apostates. And I, I gave a talk to about 40 of them. And one of the the women in the audience said that she'd just celebrated her fourth birthday because <laughs> she, she'd she started celebrating when she left. She's a woman oh. in her 30s, you know. So, um, Wow, that interesting. Yeah. And I've I've talked with a few yeah. you know, on, on my channel, um, uh, my friend Francis Peters, for example, who who was forty four years old when she left the witnesses, and she said um, she'd just grown up in this thing, and of course, women are inferior beings in this group, um, and so she'd just been a housewife. That's all she'd done, and she decided she wanted a job, and she went to a supermarket and said, "Can I have a job?" And that she's 44 years old and she's saying, I want to do the just the simplest thing. And you really treat me like I'm 15 because I really don't know how the world works. And that was a shock wow. to me, meeting that. I also had an encounter with a, a guy on a plane. I was flying to Chicago years and years ago. And this guy sat down next to me and he got a tiny little gospel and this huge concordance of the Bible, you know, telling him, what everything is in the Bible and how to. And he looked so miserable. He looked so upset. And I started talking with him. And he was 38 years old. And when he was 16, he'd been thrown out of, disfellowshipped from the witnesses. And he had spent 22 years, is that, trying to get back in. And I had just wow. one objective in that. I talked with him, it was about two hours. And I had just one objective in the conversation, which was to get him to smile. Because he was so 
distressed by it. And by the time we were done, he did smile. But, you know, it's so hard yeah. to, to see somebody who's decided that as a teenager they ruined their life. And, you know, now all yeah. they want to do is get back into this harassive horrible group you know there were rumors we were on michael michael jackson there were rumors weren't there that i suppose because of lisa marie presley that he was courted or we don't know by scientology he was certainly courted by scientology and 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 we're told that that he he just didn't want anything to do with it um even though of course lisa marie was a dedicated scientologist at this time in the 90s um but oh, you know i see but he was a lost soul, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I wonder, I mean, it's so hard, isn't it? Where if, it feels like there are, there are some places where cults and religions are almost necessary as a form of sort of discipline or regime in a family that's completely... I guess what I'm getting at is it feels like the Jackson family might have, might have used religion as a way of trying to keep the kids in line. And do you think mm -hmm. that might have led to, as you were alluding to before, immense success but unhappiness in, in Michael Jackson in particular? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, another parallel would be the Beach Boys, who were brought up again by a very repressive father who bullied them into becoming what they became. And you can see the incredible success they achieved. Of course, they then got into transcendental meditation briefly after the Beatles had left. You can see the tremendous success and then you can see the incredible damage to Brian Wilson that, that he had what, more than 20 years where he didn't do anything. And I think that was a consequence of, of a horrible childhood. And then his willingness to be taken over. Um, there's a movie about it. It's called Love and Mercy, I think, which was surprisingly good, I thought, um, about him breaking with the psychiatrist who took his life over. So he'd been conditioned to be um, controlled. And I think the same is true with Michael Jackson, that um, if you take Quincy Jones out of the equation, and I'm a huge fan of Quincy Jones because two weeks ago I watched a documentary about him and he was wonderful. Well, he is wonderful. He's 92 now. Um, I, don't, I think he was able to come along and become a parental figure and Jackson just didn't know how to function as an adult. He never knew how to function as an adult. I remember watching a documentary where he went to various sort of schmaltzy stores and bought $400,000 worth of kitsch in one afternoon <laughs> you know stuff that he'd never use it would just go into you know gaudy painting that would just go into storage somewhere I, just a lost soul and we then we you know there are so many of these groups there are so many people involved the um the phoenix brothers river and joaquin phoenix grew oh, up yeah. in the children of god <laughs> now if you know this is a group that's worse than Scientology. This is a group that has institutionalized sexual abuse. The, you know, as a three-year-old, um, there's, there's a great book called Not Without My Sister, written by three defectors from the children of God. And as a three-year-old, you're expected to watch adults having sex, and you're meant to imitate that with other children. Yeah? Whoa. Uh, yeah, look out for them. They're now called the Family International. And so right. you have the David Berg, who called himself Moses David and, and was given many other titles within. He promoted this thing called flirty fishing, where women in, in the group would be expected to go out and act as prostitutes, pick up clients and take them back to be recruited. And one of the strange episodes of my life was talking with a, a German psychologist um, a great man called Dieter Roman, who had spent six months as a, in the Children of God training women to accept this. And, you know, he'd, from that time onwards, after he'd left, dedicated his life to helping people who were coming out of cult groups. But it was such a, an austere reminder of, of, you know, the horrors in our society that, that somebody comes along and says, well, he, he kind of goes the next step after Freud and says, well, Sex is love. They're the same thing. And so you have this promiscuous group who are training children. And, you know, obviously, I mean, another thing with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and this has to be said, this should be said. In 2004, a woman called Barbara Anderson left the Jehovah's Witnesses because she'd been privy to a list of 23,000 
sexual offenders that was held by the Jehovah's Witnesses and that they refuse to give to law enforcement. And in talking with Barbara, I found that they had a program where they would go into prisons, they would talk to sex offenders, and they would forgive them. And then when the person came out of prison, they'd be looking for a widow to, to marry who'd got kids. And so the, the amount of sexual abuse that's happening within that community, with the idea, and it's a fundamental Christian idea, once you've been forgiven for your sins, you know, you're okay. But it's not really that way with sex offenders. <laughs> you know, forgiveness is great, but you actually need to make sure they don't do it anymore. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have allowed mm. it to happen. Um, so, yeah, the, the children of God, it, um, I think River Phoenix was eight when they left. And Joaquin Phoenix has, has played down um, what River said about it. R you know, and River said it was sexually oppressive. Um, then we have Tina Turner. Well, just to hold on that, the River took his own life, didn't he? He uh, did. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, he took his own life uh, a, a decade or two later yeah. after they left the Children of God. So, I mean, it must have had some, well, it may have had some lasting impact on him. I think it inevitably does. I mean, with, with Scientology, one of the things that's come up for me in dealing with second generation members is that in Scientology, you're not meant to show sympathy. And you're meant to be silent around anybody who's injured. And so I started asking people, when you were a kid, did your mum say, there, there, when you got hurt? Were you cuddled? Were you? And they weren't. They, you know, they'd get this silent treatment. And I started to think that kind of sets you up for life. We know that if during the first two years of your life you're in darkness, you'll be blind because you won't make the connections to be able to see. Nothing wrong with your eyes. You just won't make the connections. And I think that's wow. Is that I didn't? I thought you were talking metaphorically, but you no. know, like literally, if you don't, if you don't use your eyes in the first two years, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so we have to train our senses, and our interpretation of the world. Again, dealing with second generation Scientologists, they have a very confused view of what the world is. You know, because they've only seen it through this bizarre set of nonsensical ideas. The last talk we. We got into some of those. Um, and it's really hard once you've achieved adulthood to to acquire those skills. I, I kind of think of it as like a stroke victim, that after somebody's had a stroke, there'll, there'll be things that don't work anymore and they have to relearn language, they have to relearn maths, you know, and they may not be able to. And so coming away from experience where you didn't have the stimulation, and most especially, and, and this is true, with Jehovah's Witnesses, the children of God, Scientology, you don't have a loving caregiver. You don't have a person who's looking after you. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke to a guy who grew up in Scientology, uh, left when he was 19, in 1989, and thought, I've got it out of my head now. And he saw something that I'd done a few years ago about the suppressive person doctrine, and he said the room started spinning and he had to sit down because he realized that he believed that to be true, you know, that he'd not considered it. And I think that is very dangerous that if we're brought up, and the same would be true with the Ku Klux Klan, you know, or any extremist group will limit the ability of children to develop. Um, my friend uh, Calvin Pierce, um, his dad was technically the head of the American Nazi Party. And he wrote a great book called uh, The Sins of My Father. And he and his twin brother endured the most horrible time. He was beaten to unconsciousness as a six-year-old by his father. He woke up covered in, in bruises. He had to strip naked and be thrashed with a piece of telephone cord. You know? so, and, and Calvin is an incredible man. He now has... <clears throat> he's adopted 200 children through orphanages in the country of Georgia <clears throat> and wow. he is a, a loving parent to 200 kids which is and just the most wonderful man but when in talking with him it took him a long time you know into his 30s and 40s to to get over his childhood so I think if you've been in an abusive um, cult that that it makes it harder 
in some ways. So you might, you know, Danny Masterson in Scientology exemplifies just how badly wrong this can go, where somebody, they, their compassion has been eroded or it's not been encouraged. And, and I think that's a very important thing about cults, that they're groups that don't have mm. compassion for others. They consider themselves superior, elite, above everybody else. You know, they have special knowledge and they look down on the rest of us. I suppose there's also a biological lack of empathy for, for other tribes anyway. You know, you know uh, people talk about, I have such great empathy. They usually mean for people who hold the same views as me mm -hmm. and are in the same groups as me and that kind of thing. And I wonder, I mean, personally, I think true empathy, if, we're, if empathy is even anything more than an abstract notion, is being able to uh, empathize with those who are com in completely different groups to you and hold different mm -hmm. views to you. So I suppose a cult is just capitalizing on that really tribal basic instinct. Yeah, it's a really good point. There's um, a guy called Kondiaronk, what a great name that is, who was an Algonquin up in uh, North America, Canada. And he came to Europe in the 18th century um, because he'd met Europeans. And, and he said, I don't understand why you all hate each other. You know, you're always horrible to each other. You know, we're really nice to our families and we're really nice to other Algonquin. You know, we'll do anything for other Algonquin. If, however, you're an Iroquois or a Huron, we will torture you to death. <laughs> and wow. so that point you make about empathy, that there are people who are empathetic, which I consider a disorder, suffering from it myself. Um, and Christianity, of course, pushes you towards this, you know, um, give everything away and, and don't ever think about yourself and all of this kind of stuff, which I think can be quite dangerous. Um, I, you know, I think we do need to look after ourselves a little bit too. Uh, so I, I am not wearing a hair shirt today, for example, if you thought I might be. I'm not. Um, What's a hair shirt? To have a hair shirt. This is something that uh, is a tradition in Christianity that underneath all of their lovely robes, popes and higher-ups higher wear a hair shirt and it scratches all the time. I mean, it comes to its extreme oh. in Opus, Opus Day, where you wear little bits of barbed wire around your thighs and paddle yourself. I mean, Mother Teresa, I mean, talking about cults, I had no idea. And I watched the, I think they're BBC documentaries. And there's a nun who's saying, uh, you know, thousands of women joined these convents because of Mother Teresa. And she said, one day I was introduced to the discipline. And you're going, yes. And the discipline is a, a braided piece of rope. And uh, they don't tell you what to do with it. And she'd go and sit in the communal lavatories and she'd hear women, you know, hitting themselves. So she tried it on her back, first of all, but it didn't make the right sound. And then she realized these, all of these nuns are sitting there in their little cubicles, thrashing their inner thighs with a piece of rope and starting to make interesting noises as a consequence, you know. So then this is... This is sold as some kind of religious thing, you know, the masochism of, of, of the Christian, okay, particularly the Catholic Church. It's a really startling idea in the 20th century, 21st century, where, you know, by the 20th century, we'd recognize that there is this way of getting sexual pleasure through giving pain. And it's still being used, uh, you know, the idea that if I inflict pain on myself now, then that will give me more bliss in heaven somehow, which is you know, a little bit strange all in all. Is Mother Teresa an example of another person you might not have realised was in a cult? Was she in a cult in some sense? I think she was. And, and, I, and the fact that she's been sainted, when there is so much testimony about the, the way she behaved, um, I think she'd be classified as a saintly narcissist, the sort of person who has this public... Um, persona of being absolutely empathetic and saintly and wonderful but in real terms is actually causing causing tremendous suffering um, and separation alienation from the world um, I am not a I don't think monasteries and nunneries are a particularly good idea um, you know, people losing contact with the world that messiah complex that she may have had i guess that's that sort of saintly saintly thing look how good i am and i'm starting mm -hmm. a cult is that something that uh maybe there's a link between celebrities and that kind of messiah complex maybe that's why there are so many celebrities who've joined cults over the years yeah it's a reasonable point that that 
and and that sense of of being special of of having a superior knowledge to other people that you know in in preparation for this I, I there's a site that's got 70 celebrity scientologists on it and and I so I read through that and and went and there are people I didn't realize that you know that you know and I should you know I meant to know about this but like that, who well, uh, Jeffrey Lewis, for example, the actor who's, you know, whose face anybody would recognise, and he's Juliet Lewis's dad, and Juliet Lewis is a Scientologist, was brought up in it. And you get all of these statements about, um, you know, how wonderful Scientology is. And then with Juliet Lewis, there was a documentary where she was interviewed, and somebody said, this is what's on OT3, this, you know, Xenu and the body thetans and the volcanoes and all of this stuff. And she said, that's not true. And and she just walked out. Now, she'd done OT3. She knew it was true. She knew she was not being honest. And so you have this wow. division of how you treat members of your group, who are your siblings, your family, your friends, like the Algonquin and Kondirong, and how you treat outsiders, that it's okay to lie. You know, the, um, the Moonies call it heavenly deception. And... Um, I think it's Rahab in the in the Jehovah's Witnesses, the excuse that um, there was a prostitute who put up some some Jewish warriors and lied about them. And, and this is OK. And it gives a justification for saying whatever you like to people who don't belong to your group and mistreating them however you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a bad idea. Mm, that's um, Juliette Lewis, for those who don't know, who was in loads of sort of very early 90s movies like Natural Born oh. Killers, Cape Fear, What's Eating Gilbert Grape. And I, I suppose Scientology hasn't, I mean, it's, it sort of advertises itself. Some people have said they've joined Scientology because they felt it's going to help them get a leg up in, in Hollywood. But mm. other than Tom Cruise and John Travolta and uh, Nancy Cartwright, who's had the same job for 30 years anyway as the Simpsons, Bart Simpson's voice, and uh, more recently... Um, <laughs> exactly elizabeth moss uh th there aren't really that many who seem to have done much better since joining scientology i think it it's not really holding up its end of the bargain no and there are careers that failed um the incredible string band i've read sold more albums in the 60s than the rolling stones and they got into scientology and it was all downhill from there which is a terrible shame because the the two principal members uh, robin williamson and uh, mike heron were geniuses just absolutely brilliant wow. writers and performers and their management a scientologist um advised them not to go you know let the footage taken of them at woodstock be used in the movie there was a piece of career advice you know <laughs> and uh, wow. so that happens and i think careers can some sometimes languish because somebody's in, involved with the group with tom cruise a, a lot of people don't want to work with them because you know he had this thing that that um, everybody in the crew had to read dianetics the mental science of modern health uh, the modern science of mental health and everybody in the crew had to read it and the movies had to have clear sound which was instead of dolby because this was supposedly some kind of Hubbard development. I don't think he had anything to do with it, but it came out of Scientology. So you get this imposition, this, you know, you've got to do as you're told, and people are just going, I, I don't want to be on set with, with him. He's, he's too difficult. Um, and mm. also... Brad Pitt doesn't like him. No, no. And Brad Pitt's got his own winery, so, you know, we should... <laughs> we should listen to Brad Pitt. And we've got lots of other bits and pieces. Tina Turner was in Nichiren Shosu, which is you basically have a scroll called a Gohonzon and you, you pray. It's meant to be a form of Buddhism. It's um, what's called a devotional form where you pray and, you know, it, it, if you, you, you want a Mercedes Benz and you go, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? And, and you get one, apparently. And it's a thought that a woman of such fire, such vitality, should have believed something that is really rather silly. But then you kind of go, yeah, th this, this Japanese cult had 40 people in the Japanese parliament. And then you go, yeah, and Shinzo Abe, who was the premier of Japan, was a Mooney. <laughs> yes. Was he actually a Mooney? Or, uh, my, understand my understanding of Shinzo Abe was that he... Um 
helped or the, he did a speech on on their behalf or something perhaps maybe even not realizing it and as a result got shot because the fellas uh the guy who shot him then his mum had lost all their money to lost all her money to the moonies yeah i i don't know it's not something i've looked into in depth but in in talking to certainly one ex mooney he's insistent that shinzo abe was involved i mean we also we have the rumor about the former um premier of of ukraine uh, who um may very well have had some involvement with scientology um his family have denied it but a, a friend of mine who over a 10-year period was was asking are you a scientologist he would he refused to answer the question which is is kind of weird there have been members of parliament who were scientologists uh the um uh, Sonny Bono of Sonny and Cher fame would would be a I think he was a house representative in the US he was a Scientologist before he skied into a tree and that killed him so there's a piece of advice for anybody watching don't ski into trees I know about that because of some Eminem lyrics yes <laughs> okay yeah, is it, yeah when I was coming into this I was thinking about Eminem when I came into this because it said um, you know put your name here and i was going oh i'll put slim shady you know and see, see if andrew thinks that's no i thought no i won't andrew would probably think eminem was trying to be on his show or something <laughs> yeah well maybe one day but that's interesting in itself i mean eminem i didn't realize this for years that that whole thing of you know when somebody calls himself a stan or people talk about mm. stans who are these people on the internet who are huge fans of S stalker fans celebrity. stalker fans yeah yeah I've, I've interviewed one on my channel yeah oh right well, okay well, i mean that's cultish in itself but stan the, it comes apparently comes from the song stan uh, about mm. a stalker fan yeah and uh so eminem what can we say incredibly perceptive incredibly brilliant and somewhat twisted <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seems like it and it, well, the king of comedy that was a, movie, a scorsese movie back in the day and then there was mm -hmm. the joker which also had the nero in it recently about these sort of crazed fans and things like that have mm -hmm. you got a few of those yourself john crazed fans not so many um i you know i mm. I, I i've i've been very lucky really <laughs> given that um you sort of think, you know, I, I am criticising this group, and even if the group doesn't want to kill me, you know, one of their crazed members might get the idea in their head that, that it would be, you know, they'd have good karma as a consequence of doing yeah. something horrid to me. And I was, you know, harassed you know, horribly. My house was broken into a couple of times. I, I was woken up one, one day by, you know, I, I, I'm, I sleep late, as you know. I was woken up by my front door opening and i went down and my next door neighbor was just about to let a scientologist in the scientologist had conned him into open because my neighbor kept a key for me and uh, this guy went oh and ran <laughs> you know and wow. yes what was he gonna do i hate to think they you know when they the, the two break-ins i had that it was just made clear that they'd got into the house nothing was taken and uh, I mean, for two years, I had a guy who'd hired a room across the road from me and had a camera running to film anybody who came to my door, or at least the backs of their heads, you know. Um, so and and he volunteered and, and drove me places as well, you know, so that he could report directly, you know. So it does get can get a little bit involved. Um, but I think because there are now so many celebrities are outspoken against scientology leah remini at the the head of the list um that it they're, they're just too busy that they're shrinking and having to harass so many people it's it's difficult but uh so yeah. no and i i don't don't have any stalker fans either as yet probably this show you, after this you know yeah but, but this is when it's going to happen we're yeah. inviting people more or less what well, one of the um uh, weirdest ones for me of, of celebrities people might not know are in cults is Elizabeth Moss, the actress in um, Handmaid's Handmaid, Tale. The Handmaid's Tale, just because she is playing a character in a cult and she does it so well and it's so beautifully put together. Mm -hmm. It's such a brilliant book. And it, I mean, does that go to show t to what extent, I mean, how brilliant these cults are at, at making you not realize you're in them? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Isaac Hayes, you know, 
a legendary figure, Isaac Hayes, a remarkable, you know, stacks records and all of that stuff. And yeah, um, South Park. he plays chef in South Park. And and the, with South Park and, and with um, The Simpsons, um, the, you've got so many statements that are being made about authoritarianism and, and mistreatment. Um, often in very ironic ways <laughs> through Eric Theodore Cartman. But they, they, they didn't realise, and the same with Handmaid's Tale, you've got this consummate actress, she's, she's a remarkable actress, no two ways about that, who is playing somebody in an authoritarian setting and then going off at the weekends and doing courses in Scientology. And, yeah, it, it's very confusing that, that people would would be exposed to you know Matt Groening or Stone and Parker's brilliant and incisive writing and not realize it's about them but that that yeah. is a significant aspect of the compartmentalization within a cult group that these rules apply to other people but not to us and you know we're different and special and and it's it's not about us it and somehow the ability to think has been arrested, you know, along the way. One of the people that you've mentioned a few times before, but I think it's always interesting to go back into because people are just fascinated and they did, they had no idea was Charles Manson, uh, mm. who, I mean, there's the cult of Manson think People think of Manson when you think of cults, but he would, there was another cult that he was part of that people don't know about, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. Charles Manson studied Scientology for 14 months um, in 1961-62 and he believed that he'd reached the highest possible level in Scientology um, where he was permanently exterior from his body um, which is a psychiatric condition by the way um, and not good for you um, but yeah he believed that and and there are two other members of the group who were also Scientologists of the family so and in researching it I've found that that he profoundly wanted more information about Scientology he was still gathering information you know in in the year they committed the murders uh, and indeed Bruce Davis who was um, another mem a member of the family and was um, convicted of murder he was a Scientologist uh, Scientology's own papers say that uh, Steve Grogan who was also involved in the murder of Donald Shea um, he too was a Scientologist. Th this is kind of weird. I've got their internal documents saying he was a Scientologist, but I've got n as yet nothing <laughs> to, to confirm that. Um, but so, yeah, there's a strong Scientology influence there. And I, I'm absolutely confident. I'm working on, as you know, I'm working on a book about Manson at the moment. I'm absolutely confident. When I started, it was sort of, oh, it had some something to do with what happened. Now, the murders wouldn't have happened without his involvement in Scientology. Not that he was in any way directed by Scientology, but because he had come to believe certain things as a consequence of Scientology, which led to the kind of crazy uh, events of August 19, or July and August 1969. Because of Scientology, he came to believe he was a reincarnation of Jesus. And this is mentioned in all of the, the books about him, but nobody really understands that it was because of Scientology that he came to believe this. Because, you know, his childhood as a, a Christian um, it said nothing about this. But then he comes to Scientology and, um, you know, talking to my friend Karen de la Carriere, who was the person in charge of all of the Scientology um, so-called auditing uh, in their headquarters in Clearwater in Florida. She said that she was aware of 200 people at least who believed they'd been Jesus. It's not that unusual. When you start telling people, you know, you've had past lives, they'll go, oh, it was Napoleon, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. Um, it, it's inevitable. But Manson gained the conviction that he had been Jesus and that therefore, and this is kind of relevant, he was the second coming. The world was about to blow up, and in every generation there's some Christian sect that's telling us it's the end of time. The Jehovah's Witnesses, their first prediction was for 1914 that the world was going to end, 
and then they just kept moving it forward i think we're i think they're a bit more private about it now but i think 2033 is the next expected date i wonder with religion on the wane it feels like it's such a human instinct to predict the end of the world that perhaps uh, secular movements are coming forward to predict it whether it be through ai or climate change or uh, all sorts of different you know, nuclear war mm. uh, and i wonder to what extent we're now saying god you know we're, we're closer to the end than, than ever what, the doomsday clock is closer to midnight and to what extent it just or it's it's just the human condition to feel like the world's about to end because that helps you to prepare against it yeah i'm not sure how you prepare against it personally it's like oh it's all gone <laughs> i was prepared for that though. <laughs> if you're always panicking and worried if, if the natural human state is to be worried mm. that everything's about to go wrong you're, you're going to mm. at least be a little bit more careful as we should be to, to fight against those things that might bring about the end of the world that can be the case but you also have the opposite which is um there is a strong suggestion that end days christians were involved with both the first and second iraq wars that multi millionaires billionaires who believed that these were the end days that there, there's um oh here's an interesting cult dig digression zionism zionism began in the 1620s it was not started by jews it was started by english puritans and it took them 250 years to persuade jews to join in and become zionists so there's a an origin story for you and the reason that they did it was because they, they interpreted the book of Revelation as saying that all the Jews have to go back to Zion, Jerusalem, and convert to Christianity before Jesus will come. And you think, oh, that's just silly nonsense. OK, in the 1930s, Alexander Wavell, who was the commander in chief of the British Army in the Middle East, sent a, a man called Ord Wingate, who would later become famous for his fighting in Burma with the Chindits. Ord Wingate was sent to palestine to train israeli terrorist groups yeah by the british yeah. army and the reason that wingate and they're all over israel there are wingate street you know in honor of this man who helped train probably ergun and haganah you know the stern gang i'm not really sure which mobs he was involved with but showing them how to effectively blow things up and do stuff like this and the reason that wingate was so involved was he was a member of the brethren i don't know whether it was the exclusive or the Pl plymouth but here are a sect who of course believe that the world is about to end and you've got to get all of the jews back to jerusalem so they can convert to christianity and and then jesus will come and look after us all so end days belief can be really dangerous having a, a practical view as you say the doomsday clock is what two minutes to midnight now or is it one minute to midnight? Mm. I don't think it's ever been more than five seconds. minutes. 90 seconds. Yeah, a minute and a half. So we've split the difference between one and two minutes there, which is good. We're in agreement. Um, so, the, yes, since 1945, and certainly since the hydrogen bomb, you know, Oppenheimer basically tried to persuade Truman that a weapon of genocide, as he called it, was not a good idea. And his life was ruined for saying that. And um, Truman said, never, never put me in a room with that man again. He detested Oppenheimer so much. But once we got the hydrogen bomb, the possibility of doomsday was there. That was, what, about 1952 or something? It was a long time ago. Since yeah. then, and then, of course, Kennedy, you know, who is championed by so many people as this icon of loveliness started the arms race and we got to the point where the nuclear arsenal was big enough to destroy the world a thousand times over you know there have been 1800 nuclear tests because it's like oh we just we're not sure we've got it right yet let's just blow something else up and see what happens so you've got this militarism and this attitude of destruction and the possibility through you know nerve gases and biological agents and all sorts of things that the world could end that, that humanity now does have easily has the power to to destroy all life what's fascinating is that it hasn't happened that um mm. and yeah we we live in the shadow of the bomb we live in you know and that's the way it is um preparing for that 
as you say, I think working against it, um, which for me is is working against authoritarianism. It's working against situations where you've got some bully who thinks he or she is God and can tell us what to do. And then you've got, you know, probably a majority of the population going, well, I don't know what to do. And they seem certain. Let's follow them. And so we get political cults. And I must say, I tend to look at the political scene in this country, in the US, wherever I go. It's cultish. It, it's, you know, these people are put forward as great heroes, as saintly leaders. And, you know, I, I was going to actually, Kirst Armour said that he's a yimby. She's not going to catch on. Yes, in my backyard. So I was thinking of writing to him and saying, well, I'd love to build a house in your backyard, Sir, Sir Kia. Can I have planning permission to do that? Are you telling the truth that you really think that we should let people build and develop wherever they like? So just to be to be clear for people, that's a pro-housing movement in contrast and opposition opposition to the NIMBY, which is not in my backyard mm. phenomenon. The, the the YIMBY supports increasing the supply of housing within cities, uh, and that, and that's what. What about is. the what about the DIMBY? What does the DIMBY support? Isn't that the the? the no, well, we'll move on from that that jest rapidly. Obviously, didn't land. I didn't know what it is. The DIMBY. <laughs> I was going to say the the mayor of. Dimby. I just I've just. In I've just invented it, you know, because it, it sounded like a funny word. I'm sorry. I was going to say that. the mayor of was it, was it what was it called that Dawn French thing? Was it not the mayor of the priest of vicar of Dibley? Dibley, vicar of Dibley. Yeah, yeah. Isn't she great? Well, that's what I th that's what I thought of when you, you looked up to the sky as though she's you've got a poster of Dawn French, the uh, comedian. I have up in, up in your. <laughs> how did you know she's how did great. you know that yeah she's great i suppose the thing with politics is i mean it's just on every side isn't it we just start to hero worship and i i, I think it's it's probably must be the same drive as what gets us into cults as well that same like needing to look up to one particular person who has all the right answers mm. and uses all the slogans and the neuro lingu neuro linguistic programming it's all the same stuff mm. as in cults isn't it yeah and and the you know there are religious and political cults of course you know, we look at, say, the LaRouches, the followers of Lyndon LaRouche, as a cult because of, you know, right-wing group. We can certainly look at, um, you know, various of the American uh, extremist right-wing groups and European right-wing groups as cults. Um, I, in the 90s, spent a lot of time studying terrorist groups, and the mentality is the same. It's absolutist. It's, you know, black and white thinking. Uh, doing what we do is right. At the moment, I'm on the side of the Manson Project. I'm I'm reading about the Black Panthers because they were an influence upon him. He was scared to death of them, and he thought he'd killed one. And finding out that this was a group that, that did great things like feeding thousands of kids breakfast, but also got into, you know, they, their leaders, uh, Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, they said, if you want to help the movement, get a gun and shoot a cop. And you end, I don't see how that's really going to help anything personally. It's like Escobar a little bit, isn't it? Pa Pablo Escobar with the whole help. He helped so many people, uh, but but did, I think, far more bad in the long run. Yes. And, and he, he was a great force for destruction. And, and the idea that, that when he was extradited, he offered to pay Colombia's national debt out of his own pocket, you know, that he'd made that much money. And it, and that's an, that's a totally other subject how gangsterism has got into government and how governments have um colluded you know we have the davros thing the world economic forum which is a little bit you know these private meetings between corporations and politicians it's a little bit scary um yeah we have alec the the law making body in the u.s where corporations are writing laws and then giving them to congressmen you know particularly Laws about guns have been influenced by this. So, they, and I think that, you know, it's no wonder there are so many conspiracy theories because there are so many conspiracies. But however, they're, they're discrete conspiracies. They're not like, you know, alternative three and the politicians are all going to Mars, though that would be a bloody good idea, actually, if the politicians all went. Elon Musk and the politicians and Jeff Bezos and all of these people go to Mars, leave us alone. So... It's in the fabric of society and, and the religious cult becomes a political cult because it, it 
it gets its members to do so. I mean, at the moment, the Moonies are supporting Donald Trump and uh, having rallies where one of the factions of the Moonies, because since the dad died, there are, I think, three factions, but they produce guns. That's been a part of their religion for a long time. It used to make M1 carbines for the US Army when some young woman was alive. Now, one of them has said, I want every household in America to have an assault weapon. And that, that would probably bring peace, you know. Well, it's a, it's a survivalist thing, isn't it? I'm not going to knock guns because I know Americans like like their, like those things, so I don't, I don't want to piss them off. But um, but I, I don't have one yet um, of, of my own. I used one once to shoot a potato, though. But uh, it's, I think it's a different political scene in the states to the UK. I think it's so hard for us to even even fathom what, what the way they sort of live their lives. Yeah, I think the right to to bear arms, okay that's fine but the right to bear assault weapons the right to have your own nuclear weapon um you know we <laughs> talking about cults there ha happy healthy holy organization 3ho they had tanks you know at waco they had assault weapons you know that's right. and it it gets it becomes problematic you need to you know rein in the police so they're not yeah. attacking people in, and check. And there again, there's a cult, you know, that, that once you put people in uniforms and tell them they're the boss, some of them will be the best people in society. They do the hardest work in society. Let's be fair about that. You know, they clean yeah. up after the killings and all of that stuff. But they also can become authoritarian and, and bullying in their own way. And until you get that balance, and I think in the US that balance hasn't been achieved, but I think restricting assault weapons you know and unless it, you know it is a necessity in, in if a burglar breaks into your house to to put 120 bullets into them to make sure it's not dead yeah you know, so i don't i don't see that so hopefully yeah. we've, no, I understand we've got that. back some of the american viewers you were losing there <laughs> they've already walked out the moment that you, you mentioned anything to do with weapons they've gone no they're, they're well, yeah. look, well that's a cultish thing to do itself isn't it as soon as somebody says one thing slightly different to your own thing you up and leave and that's it forever um john tell us where to go and get your stuff well uh have a, an audio book of uh scientology the cult of greed that's very cheap and and it's me reading it and their core uh, piece of information largely quotations from ron hubbard you don't have to have had any experience of it and you don't have to speak the dreadful scientology language to understand it um if you want something a bit deeper uh, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky i haven't got around to reading that out yet but it's available as an ebook and print uh and of course my channel uh, john atak family and friends where we'd love to see you all well. I would love to see people go over there as well. Please do help my friend John. He's yes. just going to support his brilliant work because he. <laughs> it sounds like you're a charity, doesn't it? No, you're a brilliant, a brilliant a man charity. who has a. Fan you're not a charity. You've got a fantastic book. I'm not a charity. Let's a piece of blue sky. Let yeah, you you are you are you're everything. You're everything ever, and you're you're great, and people love you, and more people should love you, and go over to your channel, but also hit hit like on this video and watch my other episodes with John, which are flying above my head right now. So keep on watching, hit that, do those things.